what I'm going to do is try to talk a little bit today about this basic question. So the question that, that in some ways I've been asking for, for at least quite some time, uh, both in my professional life and to a, some extent before that, is basically is it, how is it that we're so smart given that we're made of bits and pieces that aren't themselves smart? So we, we're all sitting here, we've got these fancy brains, they're made up of neurons, neurons are made up of, you know, molecules and atoms, and each one of those bits in itself is not intelligent. It doesn't give rise to intelligence in and of itself. And so the question is, how is it that we can be sitting around with these really smart brains when there's bits and pieces that are themselves pretty stupid? And what I want to do is sort of take you back to the very beginning for me of this, this journey um, in, in talking and trying to figure out this question. And it goes all the way back to Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. This is a picture of a little guy named Buzzy in an attraction called Cranium Command. That's Buzzy sitting in the middle there. Buzzy is a Cranium Commando. And what he does, according to the trope in the story, is he flies inside of the brain of a 12-year-old boy. His name is Bobby. And Buzzy is kind of the captain. So he is the brains of the operation. So what he does is he pilots the ship. He gets information from Bobby's world through the eyes. He hears what Bobby hears. He has little levers and knobs, just like Captain Kirk does, to move the, the ship around, that is Bobby around. And he also gets reports in from the different parts of the body. So he gets information from the adrenal gland paid, played by Bobcat Goldthwait, uh, <laughs> which is just a great uh, piece of casting if there ever was one. Um, he's ready to freak out at any minute, which he really is ready to freak out at any minute. Um, and so what, what Bobby does is, again, he's the brains of the outfit. Now, what I want to say about this incredibly cool attraction, there's a few things I want to say. But the first thing I want to say about it is that when I gradu after I graduated from college, uh, what I decided to do was to drive down to Orlando, Florida, uh, to the casting center at Walt Disney World and ask for a job. Uh, <laughs> and they gave me one. And I was really lucky because having visited the parks on my spring breaks as an undergraduate, um, I visited this one and I loved it and so they put me on that, well not so, and also they put me on this attraction which is great because you want to be on an attraction that you like because you tend to hear it over and over and over <laughs> again, uh, get very familiar with it. But the other thing I want to say about this is that there's actually something very deep about Cranium Command. It's a certain kind of commitment about how it is that we're smart. And the answer to the question, how is it that we're smart, is that there's a little guy in our head that's running the show, a little Cranium Commando. <laughs> And with a moment's reflection, you realize that as interesting and creative and cool as this attraction is, this cannot be right. Because if there's a cranium commando inside your head, being really smart and making you smart, then it raises the question, how does he get smart? Is there an even smaller cranium commando? <laughs> eventually, the cranium commandos are too small, right? So the right answer to this question can't be something like a self, an identity, a one. Even though we feel very much like there's some central intelligence running the show, this can't be the right answer. What I want to say is that we have a way to think now as a result of both cognitive science and, and changes in technology a lot better than we used to be able to think about how it is that things get smart. And so the example that I like to use is uh, smartphones. Probably all of you have them in your pockets. And we call them smartphones not because they're actually very good at being phones. If your phone is like mine, it's actually not as good as landlines were, right? Where phone calls, by and large, didn't get dropped. You could actually hear what the other person was saying. Um, it didn't matter where you were, right? So what, what's smart about smartphones is not that they're really good phones. It's that they do lots of different things. How do they do them? Well, we have these nice things called app stores. So you download little things that can tell you what direction you're going. You can make little notes. You can check your stocks. If you really want to, you can take um, birds and sling them into green pigs, that many of whom have <laughs> helmets on their heads for reasons that surpass understanding. Um, but the point is, you bundle these things all together, and that's what makes a smartphone smart. And the idea here is that smartness comes from information processing devices that have lots of specialized applications. Small, specialized things, little bits of code that do narrow jobs. And that's what makes smartphones smart. And my claim is that your mind is another information processing device that gets its intelligence, its smartness, by having lots of specialized applications. Although, as a biologist, I don't talk about these things as applications. I call them adaptations, organized functional parts of the phenotype, of your anatomy. And this consists of lots of different parts. So you have parts that take in information and process it to give you an experience of the world, whether visual or auditory or what have you. 
You have um, mechanisms in your head that cause you to desire to eat per particular kinds of things. And we have an excellent example of someone who takes advantage um, of those uh, f food choice mechanisms and gives us all sorts of yummy things uh, that, that um, satisfy our appetites. You have mechanisms designed to produce and consume language. You have mechanisms designed uh, to understand what other people think and desire. These are called theory of mind mechanisms. You have mechanisms in your head which allow you to think about what somebody else thinks. Right? So not only can you fig think what, it, what that person believes, but you can try to figure out what that person believes about what you believe. And this allows you uh, all kinds of interesting social intelligence and strategizing. You have mechanisms designed to, to detect inconsistencies. I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, as I close. You have um, mechanisms designed to deliver benefits to those who are closely related to you. Those are little parental investment mechanisms. These are now getting into the social systems in your head. You have mechanisms designed to cause other people to like you. These are the alliance building systems in your head. You have systems for um, evaluating and selecting mates, romantic partners, and so on. You have mechanisms that cause you to avoid doing certain things, such as inbreeding. I spared you a picture for that one. <laughs> you have systems in your head designed to detect cheaters, to identify those individuals who have taken benefits without paying costs. And you have individuals for uh, you've, uh, mechanisms designed to, to, to identify those individuals who have committed wrongs, moral infractions. And I'll say a little bit more about those at the end. But before I do, I just want to say one of the key parts of your head is what I call the press secretary system. So your head is doing all these interesting things, sensing the world, making food choices, and so on. And there has to be a part that does the talking, that speaks for the collective. And what I want to say is those public relations systems have the job of maintaining a positive spin on your beliefs and your actions and so on. And this looms quite large, uh, at least in some aspects of psychology. OK. So that takes me to the cube. So the word that I selected here was doubt, because what I want to argue, or at least try to suggest to you, is that because of that basic architecture of the mind, there's lots of things which you think you know, but maybe you shouldn't be so sure about it. Let me give an example. This is a uh, picture, obviously. This is a, a letter A there, a letter B there. What I want you to do is just evaluate the extent to which those two are the same or different shades. So this is the A and this is B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take those two squares and move them over. And you'll see that those are the same. I'll take away the surround, and you can identify for yourself that, in fact, those two squares, which look quite different, are, in fact, the same. What I want you to think about is the following. Somewhere in your head, you have the percept that these two squares are different shades. Some part of your head believes, in quotation marks, that those two squares are different shades. But having just shown you these two squares here that are the same, a different part of your head believes exactly the reverse, that they're identical. What that means is that two different parts of your head, that those two parts can simultaneously maintain two opposite beliefs about the world. And that's going to turn out to be important. You might say, well, this is just something funny about optical illusions. What I'm going to say is that if that's true, if you start thinking about the brain in terms of modules, different systems with, with uh, different functions being in conflict, what I want to argue is that this actually can have interesting implications for lots of different aspects of human behavior, not just perception. Classic experiment done by Nisbet and Wilson back in the 70s. You ask people which of these four pantyhose do they like the best. The secret thing is that they're all identical. Right? Uh, because we're psychologists, so we always do things that make people look a little bit silly. Uh, it's really fun. Um, and you ask people to choose. It just turns out for reasons that don't matter. People choose the one on the right, based on the position on the table. Right? Now, if you ask people why they selected it, now we know, as psychologists, that they didn't select it on the basis of a property. They're all identical. They picked it on the basis of the position. That's not what people say. They're not going to lie. But what they say is something like, well, I chose this based on the texture. I like that the best. Now, that's not a lie. The key point there is the, that the part of you that talks simply doesn't have access to the cause of your behavior. The part of your brain that did the choosing can't transmit that information to the part that's doing the explaining. And you might say, OK, well, there's something funny about that particular experiment. Let's take a, a, a look at another one. This is more recent. Um, here is a domain of choice where people say, which one of these two do you find more attractive? And probably everyone picks the one on the right. And I say that because. The one on the right is my sister. Uh, so you better pick the one on the right. Um, so you pick, the, you pick the, that one, right? So every subject, uh, obviously, would pick that person. And then, because again, we're psychologists, we do this sneaky thing to you. What we do is we say, oh, OK, that was the one you picked. And we hide them. And we say, OK, now tell me why you picked this one. But what we do is we do the other picture. 
And if you do just the right amount of time, you can do this without the subject noticing that you've switched the picture. And now you can ask the person once again, why did they pick this? They don't say, oh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't pick that one. What they, they do is they give you a reason. You know, she looked more pleasant. She looked more alive. Uh, she had more atmosphere to her look. Right, this is my favorite. She reminded me of a good friend. This is the one they didn't pick. Right? <laughs> so the one he didn't pick, they're saying remind them of a good friend. Right? So what this is telling you is that when you give reasons to explain your behavior, you often don't have access to those reasons. The part of your brain that talks doesn't have access. So there's all this stuff going on in your brain, all these really cool functionally specialized systems that have little jobs. And then there's this little public relations system or the press secretary, press secretary systems that is trying to justify your prior actions and behaviors. And it can sometimes do that, but sometimes it's missing the information because of the way the mind is wired up. The last piece here I want to talk about is moral condemnation. So let's just talk about penguins for a second. Um, if, let's say you're a dad penguin. Um, if you're a dad penguin, what you do is uh, you invest in offspring. So you find a long-term mate. There she is, looking all cute. Um, and this is your offspring. And there's a big threat that penguin dads face, which is that the, the possibility that mom will stray and she'll have certain kinds of transactions with another penguin. And from the standpoint of Darwinian fitness, uh, infidelity is a tremendous potential cost to dad there. So what dad wants to do is morally condemn infidelity. So he wants to say people who engage in extramarital affairs or other kinds of uh, sexual liaisons, those people are bad and, they sh and those people should be punished. And in saying that, this conforms to his strategy, his reproductive strategy. He's trying to prevent other people from doing things that could potentially threaten his fitness. So what I want to think about here is this moralistic judgment system as driving one's beliefs about what is and is not wrong about the world. So we think about moral beliefs in lots of different ways, depending on your philosophical commitments and so on. What I want to say is that you can think about your moral beliefs about condemning what people do, or sometimes what they don't do, in the context of the kinds of strategic games that we play with one another, where when I say doing X, Y, or Z is bad, as long as enough other people also think that, I can prevent you from doing those things because we punish them. So what I'm arguing here is that one interesting module in your head is this little moralistic judgment system which is designed in concert with other people's moralistic judgment system to stop other people from doing certain kinds of things. So you might say things like infidelity is wrong. Okay, now let's talk about this dad again. He has these other modules in his head. So yeah, he's a moralistic guy. He's a moralistic penguin. He condemns various kinds of behaviors. But you know, sometimes there's temptations in the penguin world and there's other penguins other than his monogamous mate. And so he might be inclined to a kind of behavior to have certain kinds of transactions with this other individual. I mean, she's got the pretty bow and everything. <laughs> pretty, pretty sexy. And so what I want to say here is that the very same penguin that has this moralistic judgment module also has mating modules that drive that penguin towards behavior. In this case, having to do with transactions associated with mating psychology. And so at this, the very same penguin that has a module that says you shouldn't do X, Y, or Z might themselves do X, Y, or Z. That the inconsistency stems simply from the fact that the causal locus of behavior, the thing that drives behavior, are these little specialized applications that are designed to bring about certain things in the world. And there's nothing that homogenizes them. In the same way that you can have two different, per you can have a percept of those two squares, which is different from your belief about those two squares. You can have a moralistic psychology that is out of sync with your behavior with respect to the very rules that you think other people should obey. So the idea here is that the same penguin who is thinking, who is saying that infidelity is wrong, can have modules that are driving, them, driving that penguin towards that very kind of behavior. So the idea here is that once you have this kind of modular view of the mind, you have to be very hesitant about the possibility that you might, or at least you have to engage the possibility that you don't always know the reasons for various kinds of statements that you make and behaviors that you engage in. Because the modules that are driving your behavior are not always going to be transmitting that information to the modules that are broadcasting in the world. In the context of moral condemnation and behavior, this explains hypocrisy, because hypocrisy, at least in some people's definitions, and I know definitions vary, but is essentially when you condemn X and then you engage in X, uh, that, that act itself. 
So the idea here is that moralistic modules cause condemnation of X while other modules cause doing it, leading to hypocrisy. This is not just penguins. Uh, those of you, you might not be able to see this. This is a, a picture where it says hang up and drive. This is guns don't kill people. Drivers with cell phones do. And here's the guy on a cell phone uh, in, the, in a pickup truck at a green light. And the idea here is that the penguin example obviously is really not supposed to be about penguins. I just use that as an invitation for you to think about what we're like as people as humans condemning lots of different kinds of behaviors and I won't make the obvious allusions to a certain set of uh, politicians who have recently been in the news. Um, I really won't. Uh, all I want to say is that this, I would argue, these kinds of inconsistencies represent the natural state of the human mind because a modular architecture, an architecture of the mind that includes lots of different pieces, allows for all kinds of inconsistencies between one belief and another and between behavior and belief. So the idea here is that you get hypocrisy to pop out of this kind of modular construal of the mind. You also get lots of other kinds of inconsistencies, really interesting ones, ways in which humans are inconsistent in terms of being both patient and impatient, uh, being both moral and immoral, uh, and so on, which are addressed in, in the book uh, that's named in the title of this talk. I do just want to uh, fill one little blank in, which is there's this other funny thing, which is that if I notice something negative about myself, it's often more likely that other people will detect it. Because if I talk about it, if I allude to it, what have you. What this means is that if you think that it's a bad thing to be a hypocrite, and most of us do, you actually have an advantage if you don't notice it. Because if I don't notice it, maybe you're not going to notice my inconsistency. Now, if that's true, if that's true, if it, if it turns out that we're not particularly good at noticing our own inconsistencies, it really would seem as though I might not be that inconsistent, but it kind of feels like everyone else is a hypocrite. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention this afternoon. Thank you.